Hey, we're excited as a church today to be beginning a new series, the first series of this year, entitled Refresh. Refresh. And we're really believing that God is going to bring refreshment over His people and you as the church. I want to bring a message that will hopefully encourage us and begin us in the journey of Refresh. Refresh. And so if you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write down the title of my message, which is simply this, it's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like. Not what it looks like. That's right. It might look like just another pastor giving a message at a mega church in Michigan or Missouri, but if you think that, you'd be in the wrong hemisphere. Hello, Bezel T3. You see, it's not what it looks like. It's actually the largest mega church in New Zealand. It's called Arise. It's a multi site church with locations in Christchurch, Dundon, Hamilton, Kapiti, Masterton, Palmerston North. Pori, Ewa, Selwyn, Wellington, and Fungaray, and the ever ubiquitous online church. Now, sadly, Arise Church has recently fallen victim, well, uh, to that all too common occurrence these days with megachurches. There was a pastoral shakeup due to allegations of exploitation and abuse on the part of the leadership. The founders of Arise Church have fallen. The most important thing to us at Arise, we are committed to loving people. John and Gillian Cameron, the church's pastors, and John's brother Brent Cameron, resigning after allegations of serious mistreatment of interns and workers. Hmm. You know that saying, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? Well, church leaders are certainly not immune to that problem. So John Cameron is out, and the new kid on the block, Ben Kidru, along with his wife Amy, are now at the helm of the good ship Arise. I want to take a moment right now, wherever you are tuning in around the world perhaps, or maybe from Arise in different locations over the next few weeks, welcome to 2024 here in Wellington. Can we say hi to everyone? I want to begin today, I want to begin this year with a declaration that I believe God's word for our church up and down Aotearoa for this year is that He is bringing refreshing to Arise Church. He is going to refresh Refresh. our church. Amen. Is anyone happy about that? Okay, if you've not caught it yet, the word of the day is refresh. Now, I'm not sure it's a uh, official prophecy bingo word just yet, but we'll have to see what happens. Today, however, we're not looking at Pastor Ben Kidru, but rather Pastor Logan Craig, the life group pastor at the Arise Church Wellington location. Now, I thought I had already heard the worst sermon of of 2024 thus far. But then this happened. You know how videos will have this title? I saw my dog uh, coming through the back door, but then this happened. Well, I I may or may not use that. So let's get started as Logan lays the groundwork for his sermon entitled, It's Not What It Looks Like. I'm sure that you're probably similar to me and you spend a lot of time on a computer doing different things. And for me, and Across a week, I'll spend multiple times on my computer, multiple windows open, trying to do different tasks. And this Mm -hmm. is kind of what I want to speak to here today, is around this concept of coming into a new year that for us as Christians, we need to just maybe hit refresh in a way, get a fresh perspective, look at things differently to how we've looked at them before. So as there's a need to refresh a web page from time to time, Logan wants to speak to us because like a frozen web page, we need to be refreshed in this new year 2024. Notice that Logan has already decided that this is what he wants to talk about. So the only thing left to do is select a passage of scripture, if taken out of context, will allow him to do that. So I wanna go to a passage of scripture, as I said in John. John chapter 21, we're gonna read from verses one through to 14. Okay, John 21 is the last chapter in the Gospel of John. It begins this way. 
After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. It's much like John 5, 1. After this, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days, or John 7, 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. The after this indicates a nonspecific period of time. John is connecting what happened in this chapter, 21, with the end of chapter 20, where Jesus' earthly gospel ministry is now coming to a close. Jesus had appeared to the disciples a couple times after his bodily resurrection from the dead. This appearance would not be his last, but it is the last appearance recorded in John's gospel. John lists those who were present for this appearance. We have James and John, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, I think that's the, 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 the only other time he's mentioned other than when he's first mentioned uh, in the, the beginning of John. And then we see that Jesus calls these men to be disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And we're told in verse 3 of, ch- of uh, chapter 21 that Peter wanted, for reasons not explained in the text, to go fishing. So we're going to pick it up from there. So here we see the disciples going out. They make a decision to go out and fish. The boys are on board. They're excited. They're pumped about it. They jump in their boat, make their way out. Then they toil and they fish all night, it says, only to return the next morning with absolutely nothing in their boat. No mm-hmm. fish to speak of whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're told that the other disciples did join Peter but I'm puzzled as to how Logan knows that they were excited and pumped about it. Night fishing is not like going on a Christian men's retreat. It was hard work. And this night they caught nothing. And as they were returning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know that it was him. Jesus calls them out and says, children or lads, uh, do you have any fish? And they answered, very negatively, probably. No. Then Jesus said to these seasoned fishermen, hey, try the net on the other side of the boat and you will find some. Now, this is very much like Luke uh, chapter 5, verse 4. In this regard, uh, we read there, when Jesus had finished speaking, remember he used Peter's boat, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, I have to wonder if the disciples are being reminded of that other incident, incident, sorry, right about now. You know, for me, this is kind of like us being on the web page and we're trying to find the information. We're trying to find the answer that we so desire. And we're just sitting there looking at it, thinking, why isn't this changing? I'm doing all the right things, you know? These guys are fishing. They're throwing the rod out. They're in a great, you know, space to be fishing. Probably it's a spot where they'd normally catch a lot, but for some reason they're not. And here they have this decision of what to do, you know? What to do. They've spent all night, I'm sure, straight away, the first response for them is like, why on earth would we go back out? We've just been out there. We've caught nothing. There's no point in returning. But Jesus gives them this option and says, hey, throw your net on the right side of the boat. There you'll find your fish. Uh Okay, again, this is very similar to Luke chapter 5. After Jesus had borrowed Peter's boat to teach the people, he told Peter, again, put out to the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon Peter answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But then he says, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish. Okay. And it says, their nets began to break. Now, this fishing episode in Luke chapter 5 was the beginning of Peter spending three years with the Lord Jesus. But in chapter 21 of John, it was after Peter had betrayed him and after he had seen him alive after being crucified. And they do that. They throw their net on the right side of the boat and they haul in this massive load of fish, more than they could contain, more than they could handle. And you know, the first thing that I want to highlight around this is the fact that blessing comes in the form of a problem. (laughs) Now, 
I want to say in the strongest possible way that catching a great haul of fish is not the point of this passage at all. Blessings come in the form of a problem? Where on earth does that come from? Okay, immediately after this haul of fish, it says in verse 7 that the disciples, oh, I should say, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, uh, well, he said, it is the Lord. Now, now, hearing this, Peter put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea, heading for the shore. This passage is about Jesus, and it's about Peter. But I'm, I'm sorry, and unfortunately, Logan has other plans. And it makes me wonder how many times are we going through something, believing God for something, and we're looking for the breakthrough, we're looking for the blessing, but we don't see it simply because we haven't had a moment with God to refresh our perspective, to see it how God sees it, to respond to what He's asked of us. We haven't had that moment to refresh the browser on the computer screen. So God provides this enormous catch of fish, but it's too big, almost too big for these guys to handle. What the disciples needed to do is refresh, just like refreshing a web browser. It, it's kind of like me wanting to talk about not being afraid to try new things. So I go over to Acts chapter 10, and I use verses uh, 10 through 13, which read, And he, Peter, became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. <laughs> you know, try new things. That's exactly what's happening here in Logan's sermon. We read the same story in other gospels and we see that a call goes out to other boats that are nearby to come and help them. And they actually help them bring in this load of fish. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it, it's not the same story. This story is Jesus appearing to his disciples after his glorious resurrection from the dead. There's, this is a huge difference. I mean, so far, the emphasis is on the disciples' burning desire to be blessed by a big old load of fish. And they get it. But now the blessing was, was too much. And, and that's a problem. But no, no, God had it sorted. He knew that that's what they, what they were so desired. They wanted the fish, they wanted the blessing to come. But God knew that they would make it back in. He knew that they were gonna be okay. They had the resource, they were doing the right thing. So I wanna encourage you as you go into this year, some things aren't gonna look the same as what they did last year. If you would just be willing to hit the refresh button with God, get a new instruction, grab a new perspective, Oh. And suddenly you see the blessing of God come upon your life in such a way that you maybe for a moment will think, how on earth am I going to handle this? But then you realize, hang on a minute, my God's so gracious that He's resourced me. He's given me everything I need to hold on to this blessing and this outpouring. I'm sorry. See, it's not what it looks like. This looks like a sermon, but it's not. I mean, how on earth can a pastor have a text like this and yet willingly drive off the hermeneutical road and deliberately swerve right into a grimy gully of personal prosperity and blessing? We see, uh, as I said before, an account in Luke, same story, different gospel. No. It's not the same story. Luke chapter 5 is the story of Jesus calling his disciples at the beginning of his ministry. John chapter 21 is Jesus appearing after his death and resurrection to his disciples. Luke chapter 5 is Jesus borrowing Simon Peter's boat to preach. John chapter 21 is Jesus on the shore making breakfast for his disciples. Luke chapter 5 is Peter wanting to distance himself from Jesus because of his awareness of his sinfulness and being in the presence of, of a holy man is what he knew at the time. John chapter 21 is Peter jumping off a boat in order to get to Jesus because he knows that Jesus is the source of life. And here we see in this account where it says that the nets 
broke. The nets began to break. You know, how often are we doing something, believing God for it, believing God for the miracle and the breakthrough and the blessing comes. And then we suddenly feel like we're not equipped and empowered to take a hold of everything that God has given to us. Neither John 21 or Luke 5 are about big catches of fish or nets or about uh, being torn or breakthroughs or blessings or our ability to handle them. They are both about Christ Jesus, one at the beginning and the other at the end of his earthly ministry. But Logan, having fallen for the lie of giving the people what they want instead of what they need, is fixated on the blessing of a big catch of fish and the net. One reading that I saw was that an indicator for that of the breaking of the net is that perhaps the net that they were using was a secondhand net. It got me thinking, you know, how often we going about our business, going about our day, trying to see great things happen in our own life, but we're reliant on someone else's resource, someone else's gifting. This is so sad. I mean, this passage is screaming Christ and him crucified, now risen from the dead. Jesus is appearing to his disciples over a 40-day period in preparation for the coming of God the Holy Spirit into every believer's heart at Pentecost. Now, perhaps there's still hope that Logan will leave uh, that secondhand net behind and get to the plain reading of the text. You know, he's given you a net that will contain the blessing, will contain the catch. If we just stay in tune and in step with him, he will do it. He will enable you. Mm, mm -mm. No, no. He's all in with this big fish fiasco. He's determined to stick with the net, you know, the internet or the fish net. I'm not sure. Motif, the net that holds your big fish blessings in 2024. See, you got to trust the net in 2024. Don't freak out and think that the net will break. Well, why? Because Logan's going to declare it. That's why. I don't want to encourage us. Let's not freak out and worry that our nets might break. You know, I believe and I want to prophesy over every person joining us today that 2024 would not be a year where you feel like your nets would break. I want to, I want to, I want to declare over you that there is resilience coming upon you. There is a grace coming upon you that's going to allow you to take a hold of everything that God has for you. If you would just take moments with Him, listen to Him. Man, I, I want to declare your nets will not tear. They will not tear. You will not be stretched beyond your capacity and therefore snap, you know? My goodness, this, this is incredible, really. Now, I did not show it before, but I want you to know, which makes this all the more terrible and astounding, that Logan did read the entire passage of John 21, verses 1 through 14. Let me prove it to you. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. Mm -hmm. And he did the same with the fish. Mm -hmm. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So it, it's not like Logan ignored the passage of John 21 that went beyond the net of fish. But then he preaches like the resurrection of Jesus and his appearances to his disciples never happened. I mean, there is so much good stuff about the Lord Jesus in this amazing chapter in John chapter 21. And yet Logan has camped out on the, not the point of the passage, the blessing of a big catch of fish and the net. So I'm believing and, and declaring over you today that your nets will not tear, that your God is going to grow your capacity. He's going to build you up so you're going to be ready to grab a hold of everything that he has for you. Amen. Is it possible? Is it possible that there could be a more man-centered, your best life now interpretation of this text? I don't think so. Now, let's see how Logan brings this boat called a sermon botched, bloated with big fish blessings into the harbor as he attempts to moor it to the dock. Now, application from a text of scripture is always helpful in a sermon. If 
It's anchored to the true meaning of the text. I want to encourage you, continue to fish, whatever that looks like for you. Continue to do that. But realize and create moments where God can come and meet you on the beach and call out to you. And when He responds, when He engages with you, man, turn your ear to Him. Listen to His instruction. Listen to His encouragement. Listen to His empowerment of you. And then go about what He's asked you to do. Because I believe it's when we stay obedient that that's when the blessing can come. That's when our breakthrough can come. Amen. If you'll just keep doing the right thing, your breakthrough is on the way. That's not exactly the application I was hoping for. In fact, what we were just told is that for God's blessing to come into our lives with big fish overflow, we must continue to fish and look for God on the beach and most of all, be obedient. Now I ask you, is that what John chapter 21 is trying to teach us? I mean, it's painfully obvious that Logan has missed the biblical forest for the trees of prosperity. Logan missed Jesus, and in doing so, preached a sermon that God the Holy Spirit wasn't able to use to draw people to the truth of the gospel. Now, why is that? Well, because the gospel was not preached. Jesus is all over John chapter 21, and yet Logan somehow managed to avoid him altogether. It's not until Logan's concluding prayer that the Lord Jesus gets, well, a quick, honorable mention. Say, dear Jesus, I thank you for speaking to me. I thank you that when you died on the cross, you died for me so that I could live free. Today I receive your love, your forgiveness, your grace, in your salvation. I'm sorry for my sin, but from this day on, I choose to follow you. Hmm. Be my Lord, be my Savior, now and forever, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Well, a huge congratulations to every person who has just prayed that prayer for the first time. So proud of you, such an awesome decision. Congratulations, and he's so proud. Well, well, decisional regeneration aside, <laughs> it's so sad that there was more gospel in that prayer of Logan's than in his entire sermon. I mean, it's almost as if accepting Jesus is simply a prerequisite for receiving the net with all its fishy blessings. So, in my opinion, what did Logan neglect in this amazing passage of Scripture. Well, the first thing to say is that chapter 21 of John's Gospel, well, it's, it's amazing that it's there at all, seeing that chapter 20 ends so nicely. It, it ends this way. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, And that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. You see, but by the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, John had one more resurrection account he wanted to proclaim. Remember John 2.11 when Jesus changed the water into wine? This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. You see, during his earthly ministry, the glory of Jesus was manifested in the signs that he performed. But here, in John 21, Jesus is manifesting his glory in his person, in his resurrected and now glorified body and soul. This post-resurrection appearance is the third time John records Jesus appearing to his disciples. And the main point of this whole event seems to be that Jesus was preparing his disciples, now turning apostles, to declare with boldness for the rest of their lives the historical fact of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. 
Now, it's interesting that Peter was so excited to be near Jesus that he jumped out of the boat to swim towards the shore. But kind of like a dog chasing a car and once catching up to that car, the dog doesn't quite know what to do with it. And it seems the same way here as we see Peter going back to the boat once it reaches shore to assist the other disciples in offloading that huge catch of fish, all 153 of them. Very odd number. You don't see that number anywhere else in Scripture that I know of. And and it's got a secret meaning. I didn't know if you know this. It means uh, that there was 153 fish, okay? Okay, one more point that leads to the rest of chapter 21. In verse 9, we see that Jesus had prepared a charcoal fire with fish laid laid out on it and bread. There is only one other place in in the entire New Testament where a charcoal fire is mentioned. It's John 18, 18. We read there, Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was with them, standing and warming himself. This was the place where Peter denied knowing Jesus three times, the last time even making curses and swearing that he didn't know him. The the remainder of chapter 21, from verse 15 on, is Jesus dealing with and restoring Peter from his guilt and the shame over his woeful denial of the Savior. And what a wonderful Savior we have. Not only did he truly live and die and rise again victoriously for those who trust in him, but he also is a tender and sympathetic Savior who knows our every weakness and is ready to forgive us and remind us that we belong to him. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to who is unable able to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This ultimate blessing of intimate union with Christ belongs to every Christian. Faith, repentance, and obedience spring forth from that union. They are not qualities we have to muster up in order to receive that union. The Christian is blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, all there is left to do in this life is live like it. Refresh!